and spiritual sanghas, and attending meditation or retreats to enhance our understanding, wisdom, and practice. We undertake a lifelong tour. Dash. Nay is growth and awakening. I. Awakening. Buddha. Most of us enter recovery with one goal in mind, to stop the suffering that got us here in the first place, whether that was drinking, using drugs, stealing, eating, gambling, sex, codependency, technology, or other process addictions. As newcomers, most of us will be satisfied with simple damage control or reduction in harmful behavior. We want to stop hurting ourselves or others in particular ways. You're reading this because there is a spark of wisdom in you that desires to seek the end of the suffering of your addiction. You've already taken the first step on the path to your own awakening. Everyone who has made the wise intention to recover, wherever they are on their path, has access the pure, wise part of themselves that the wreckage of ad. Dash. Diction can never touch. So many of us have hearts that are still in pain from the suffering. We've experienced. Some have undergone trauma which often led us to seek temporary relief in our addictive behavior which unintentionally added more suffering to our original wounds. We tried to protect our dash selves by running from the pain, putting on a mask, and pushing people away for fear of being vulnerable, all to adapt to what often feels like a hostile world. We start to recover when we let ourselves believe in and rediscuss. Dash. Through our pure, radiant, and courageous heart where we find our potential. For awakening resides. Who were we before the world got to us? Who are we beyond the obsession of our conditioned minds? Who are we beneath all our walls and heartbreak? Despite the trauma, addiction, fear, and shame, there is a still and centered part of us that remains whole. There is a part of us that's not traumatized, that's not addicted, that's not ruled by fear or shame. This is where wisdom comes from, and it's the foundation of our recovery. If you're at the beginning of your recovery journey, it may seem impossible to access this part of you. But you're here because you already have. Perhaps you felt some small glimmer of hope, maybe born out of desperation, that there might be a way out, that things could change if you took wise action and reached out for help. Maybe it feels impossible to have faith in this part of you, to believe that you have the potential to be capable of wisdom and kindness and ethical deeds, to believe you can be the source of your own healing and awakening. Recovery is a gradual process. This path is a lifetime of individual steps. It's not only the bud, dash, these example that shows us the way, but also those before us who have gone through the process of recovery and made it to the other side. They show us that we can, too. Too. So what does the Buddha have to do with recovery? There are two ways in which we use the word Buddha, which means, awaken. First, it is the title given to Siddhartha Gautama, a prince who lived in modern-day Nepal and in India roughly 2,500 years ago. After many years of scholarly study, meditation, and ethical practice, 
he was awakened to the nature of human suffering and discovered a path that leads to the end of suffering, and the freedom that comes from Awak. Dash. Ending. After his awakening, Siddhartha came to be known as the Buddha. The second use of the word Buddha follows from the first. But. Dash. Dha can refer, not only to the historical figure but also to the idea of awakening, the fact that each of us has within ourselves the potential to awaken to the same understanding as the original Buddha. When we take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge not in Siddhartha as a person, but in the fact that he was able to find freedom from his suffering and so can we. The story of the original Buddha. To understand the nature of this awakening it could help to know something about the life of Siddhartha Gautama. One of the many versions of the story of the Buddha tells us that Siddhartha was a wealthy prince, born into privilege, and sheltered from much of the suffering of the world. The story goes that young Siddhartha sneaked away from his palace and saw people suffering from old age, sick, dash, ness, and death. He realized that no amount of privilege could protect him from this suffering. Wealth wouldn't prevent it. Comfort wouldn't prevent it. Pleasure wouldn't prevent it. Despite having a life of ease, Sid, Dash, Dartha still found that he experienced suffering and dissatisfaction. He was born with everything, but it wasn't enough. This persistent dissatisfaction with life, whether dramatic or subtle, is called Nuka, a Pali word we still use today. All humans ex. Dash. Harry and Stuka, but some of us, particularly those of us who have struggled with addiction, seem to experience it on a more intense level. And with worse consequences. What is addiction but the consistent and nagging feeling of not enough? What is addiction other than being constantly unsatisfied? Siddhartha saw that pain was an unavoidable part of life, and he became determined to find a way to put an end to it. He left his family, and for a time, lived the life of an ascetic, the extreme opposite to his previous life of comfort and wealth. As an ascetic, he sat in extremely un -dash comfortable postures meditating for long periods of time. He slept very free, little. He ate very little. He even tried breathing very little. He thought that, since material comfort hadn't eliminated suffering, maybe the oppo dash sight of material comfort would. At the brink of death, Siddhartha Vaughn dash known the idea of extreme asceticism and instead chose what he called the middle path. Siddhartha realized that both the extremes of pleasure and death, death, denial of pleasure had brought him nowhere nearer to liberation. Neither extreme had given relief from his suffering. So he set off on his own to meditate. Sitting beneath a bony tree, he meditated deeply and looked up. Yeah. Third, the path that leads to the end of suffering. He looked within himself for his own liberation, and he found it. What Siddhartha understood as he meditated under the Bodhi tree is known as the Dharma, or the truth, which explains the causes and nature of cyclical suffering. It's the basis of the teachings of Bud, Dash, 
PHISM. Central to this path are the four noble truths in the Eightfold Path, which will be explained in the next chapter. Siddhartha is called the Buddha, or the one who wrote. Up, because most people go through life with a false sense of reality. Like being in a trance. The Buddha spent the rest of his life developing the Dharma into a simple but sophisticated system. He shared it with anyone who would listen, dedicating himself to a life of service to free everybody from suffering. He defied the norms of his time by letting women in the poorest class of citizens become monastics. Everyone was welcome in his Sangha, his spiritual community, central to his teachings, was the idea that liberation is available to all, to the most broken and oppressed among us, to the sick, to the powerless, to those who have lost everything, to those who have nothing left to lose, all of us, even the most addicted, the most lost, can find our way to awakening, because we all have the ability to access the pure, wise, and true nature within each of us, walking in the footsteps of the Buddha. The story of the Buddha may seem far removed from our every dash. Day reality, but his life before and after his awakening offers as a model. For our own lives, all of us can relate to the inevitability of suffering, aging, sickness, and death have touched us all. We've experienced the truth of impermanence, the highs we achieved in our addiction now. Jack, ways wore off. But we kept chasing them anyway. We've also endured other forms of suffering, some self-inflicted and some at the hands of others. And we've dealt with subtle forms of dukkha, the annoyances, the boredom, the loss of what we want, the inability to keep what we have. The impatience with life, the refusal to accept what is, and what have we done with these experiences of suffering. At this point most of our stories start to look different from Siddhartha's, and this difference is what led us here. Instead of sitting with our suffering, we found ways to change it, avoid it, or replace it with something more pleasurable, for some of us, that came in the form of drinking or using drugs, others used sex, relationships, food, self-harm, gas, things, technology, work, or gambling, and some of our stories contain a version of all of the above, whatever the behavior, it was just a tempo, Dash. Rary solution that always led to deeper suffering for ourselves and others. We've come to realize that our stories don't have to continue like this. The life of Siddhartha and the lives of the countless people we meet. In recovery we have found an end to the suffering of addiction through two. As the there is a 
here to help us along the way. We don't have to identify as Buddhists, and we don't have to meditate for hours each day, but we have found that the path outlined in the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path can lead us to liberation from both the suffering of addiction and the suffering that comes from simply being human. We trust in the potential in all of us to find freedom from this suffering. The truth, Dharma, as people who have struggled with addiction, were already in deep, dash, made familiar with the truth of suffering, even if we've never heard of the Buddha, at some level we already understand the core of the teach, dash, king, that in this life, there is suffering. It can be incredibly liberating to hear this said so plainly and directly. No one is trying to convince or convert us. No one is telling us. We have to believe something. No one is sugarcoating our experience. The Buddha also taught the way to free ourselves from this soup. Dash. Bearing. When the Buddha awakened, he understood how samsara, or the cycle of existence, came to be and how it is maintained. The heart of these teachings which we call the Dharma is the Four Noble Truths. These Four Truths and the corresponding commitments are the foundation of our program. 1. There is suffering. We commit to understanding the truth of suffering. 2. There is a cause of suffering. We commit to understanding that craving leads to suffering. 3. There is a way of ending suffering. We commit to understanding and experiencing that less craving leads to less suffering. 4. There is a path that leads to ending suffering. We commit to culti. Dash. Batting the path. Like a map that shows us the path, these truths help us find our way in recovery. The first noble truth. There is suffering. Some of the ways in which we may experience suffering are obvi. Dash. Out. Like poverty, hunger, pain, disappointment, and feeling separated or excluded. There is also suffering due to the divisions of our world, such as war, colonization, and oppression. Some are less obvious, like feelings of cravings, anxiety, stress, and uncertainty. We also suffer as we struggle with birth, aging, sickness, and death. As much as we want to avoid what we consider unpleasant and hold on to what we label as pleasant, dissidents, dash, faction, separation, loss, and injustice still may frequently arise. Suffering occurs whenever we fail to see the true nature of our existence, when we insist on controlling or altering our reality. The first noble truth rests on the understanding that our lives seem unsatisfactory because experiences are impermanent and impersonal. Dash. Al. Our senses which the Buddha understood to include not just hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touch, but also thinking are often unreleased. Dash. Able and temporary, which means that the way we experience and make sense of the world is constantly changing and subjective. We suffer me. Dash. Because we keep expecting these temporary experiences to be permanent and absolute, and to satisfy our craving for pleasure or to avoid pain. Many of us have suffered by trying and failing to control our dependencies, habits, and addictions. We've used every kind of willpower, dash, bargaining, planning, and magical thinking, 
each time imagining them. Result would be different, and blaming ourselves when it turned out the same. How many times did we promise? Just this one last time, then. I'm done. I'll just use or drink on the weekends, or only after work, or only on special occasions. I'll never drink in the morning. I won't do the hard stuff. I'll never get high alone. I'll never use at work or around my family. I'll never drink and drive. I'll never use needles. How many diets have we tried? How many times have we said? We wouldn't binge, or purge, or restrict calories, or over-exercise. How many times have we looked at the scars on our arms and vowed to never cut again? How many times have we let our wounds heal, only to break them open once more? How many limits have we set on ourselves around technology? Or work, only to get pulled back in? How many times have we vowed to have no more one night stands? Vowed to stay away from certain people or places or websites? How many times have we crossed our own boundaries and been consumed by shame? How many mornings did we wake up hating ourselves, vowing to never do again what we did last night, only to find ourselves repeat, dash, in the same mistake again just a few hours later? How many times did we attempt to cure our addictions with therapy, self-help books, cleanses, more exercise, or by changing a job, or relationship, how many times did we move, thinking our shadow, wouldn't follow us, how many promises did we make, how many times did we, break those promises, having suffered and struggled with addiction in its many, Forms. We've come to understand this first truth as it relates to Rekub. Dash. Hurry. Addiction. Is. Suffering. We suffer when we obsess. When we cling. And grasp onto all of the delusions of addiction. All the impermanent. Solutions to our discomfort and pain. We try to cure our suffering by using the very substances and behaviors that create more discomfort and pain. All our attempts to control our habits demonstrate how we've been clinging to the illusion that we can somehow control our ex fairy dash ends of the world or how others have treated us. We're still trapped in the prison of suffering. In fact, we're reinforcing its walls every time we act on our addictions. Liberation comes when we gain a clear understanding of where our real power lies, and when we are throwing it away. This is a program of empowerment. It's a path of letting go of behavior that no longer serves as in cultivating that which does. Trauma and Attachment Injury Many of us have experienced trauma, often described as the Psy Dash Chological damage that occurs after living through an extremely fright Dash Any more distressing event or situation For some of us, this trauma can Be a long-term experience It's caused by an overwhelming amount of Stress that exceeds our ability to cope, and may make it hard to function. Even long after the event, trauma can come from childhood experience. Dash. S or from events that occur in our adulthood. It can be sudden, or it can develop over time from a series of events that change how we occur. Dash. Seek ourselves in the world. 
This also includes the resulting trauma from discrimination and bigotry. While trauma frequently comes from life-threatening events, any situation that leaves one feeling emotionally or physically in danger can be traumatic. It's not the objective facts of the events that define the trauma, the stress is relative and what might be considered traumatic for one may not be for others. Generally, the more terror and helplessness we feel, the more likely it is we'll be traumatized. Attachment injury can be just as insidious and harmful as trow, dash, ma, and can have the same impact. It's defined as an emotional wound to a core relationship with a caregiver, often caused by abuse, neglect, or inconsistency of care in early childhood. Trauma and attachment injury can impact our recovery and meditation practice in slightly different ways. With trauma we may feel fear, even panic, or distrust when asked to sit in meditation, even when intellectually we know we're in a safe place with a supportive group. It may be triggering to be asked to be present in our bodies and minds, or to focus on our breath. It might also feel unsafe when your identity is uniquely different from the majority of the Sangha. Attachment injury may show up as a hesitation to trust people, or a process, as a reluctance to be part of a recovery group or Sangha, or as a core belief that we don't belong. In this case, the nurturing thing to do for ourselves might be to lean into this discomfort compassionately. Engage, and investigate the stories we're telling ourselves about not be Dash Longing Again, it's key to become aware of the nature of the harm we Carry with us Trauma and attachment injury may require different ways Of feeling safe and supported You should always do whatever is most Compassionate for yourself in the moment and seek outside help when you need it. Trauma and attachment issues are relevant to suffering and add dash addiction because they can have a huge impact on our mental and physical health. Studies show that those who struggle with addiction have often experienced trauma at some point in their lives. What we try and use to make us feel better, whether it's substances or behaviors, often only reinforces the cycle of aversion and craving that will lead to more soup. Dash. Bearing. The brain can be overactive when trauma is present because it perceives a very real threat, and the body often responds with feelings of helplessness, fear, and vulnerability. This system can be easily thrown into overdrive when one's life experience screams, you're not safe. Danger. Danger. Even when the danger is no longer present. For some people, post-traumatic symptoms may be increasingly severe and last long after the original events have ended. Many of us have intrusive thoughts that seem to come out of the blue, or we feel confusion, or mood swings we can't link to specific events. Traumatic responses may 